Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss the eyeball, the fundamentals of the eyeball. You know, we've already disposed of the orbit and that next side. Now it's time to talk about the eyeball per se. And here we're going to do the anatomy, the physiology, and the biochemistry, the pathology, and the microbiology, what's required of ophthalmology. Very well. So let's do that. To start with, let us see. We all know the eyeball and the or the globe occupies 6 ml, is not? Remember, I said the orbit is 30 ml, the eyeball is 6 ml, the eyeball occupies 30 percent of the orbit only. Okay, so that volume is important. And this eyeball is encased, encased in a kind of wrapping which is known as the Tenens capsule. Tenens capsule, and this Tenens capsule is spent, suspended. This eyeball wrapped in a wrapping paper like Tenens capsules is suspended from the Lockwood's ligament, okay. Now, Lockwood's ligament is like a hammock and you can imagine the eyeball resting on the hammock and remember the anatomy of the orbit and the eyeball is such that the eyeball is not really resting on the floor. In fact, it's closer to the roof of the orbit rather than the floor and the Lockwood's ligament holds this and gives its stability in the vertical plane, okay. And the accessory eyeball structures are the structures which surround the eyeball in the orbit which means the muscles, the fat pads, the eyebrows, the cranial gland, we also call them axillary eyeball structures, but they surround the eyeball around the orbit. And let's begin with the three layers of the eyeball. You're all aware that the eyeball has three layers. You know? The good lord created the eyeball in three different layers. The outermost layer, which is fibrous, the middle layer, which is vascular, and the inner layer, which is the neural layer. Isn't it? So three layers, and they are in concentric layers like a series of matrushka dolls, they are one inside the other, like a series of nesting dolls. You can see them here. The outer layer is the cornea sclera. Second, the middle layer is the uvea, and the inner layer is the retina. It's not three layers, and this is the way. So let's discuss them. But you know, when we start doing anatomy, you must take a pen and paper and start drawing. You know, in any surgical subject, particularly ophthalmology, we have a very simple rule. Okay, all surgeons particularly of the mollus, believe in this rule, it says that if you can't draw a structure, if you can't sketch a structure, you don't know its anatomy, okay? So you have to know how to draw it, okay? So please follow me in a series of few strokes. In a few strokes, we will see how to draw the eyeball and this will make our life easier. Let's look at that. So let me start with this. This is the eyeball here. And let's draw it like this. The outermost layer, we all know, the outermost layer is this layer. It looks a bit like this. This is the outermost layer. It consists of three parts. Okay, it consists of three parts. What are these? The anterior one sixth is clear and transparent. This is called the cornea. Anterior one sixth is clear and transparent. The posterior five sixth is white and opaque. This is called the sclera. And the junction of the two, where the cornea and the sclera meet, this is the limbus. This is the limbus, okay? And of course, the optic nerve comes and extends like a tail from the eyeball. This is the optic nerve holding that. Remember, the eyeball has seven attachments. The eyeball, as it's held in the orbit, has seven main attachments. Remember that. And what are the seven times? Six of them are muscles. What are that? Superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. Six muscles and one tail, so called the optic nerve, they suspend the eyeball inside the orbit. So if you want to remove the eyeball from the orbit, you have to cut through these seven attachments. A process called as enucleation. Enucleation means removing the eyeball or the nucleus. You cut through the seven attachments, the six muscles and the one optic nerve takes about one hour and one hour the eyeball is out. Okay, so this is the outermost layer. So this is what we'll talk about the questions here. Let's do that. The cornea, sclera and limbus. Very well. So let's look at that. I said the cornea occupies anti 1 sixth, the sclera posterior 5 sixth, and the function. Let's talk about the sclera now. The sclera, what is the basic uh, point of existence, is it's for protection and maintain the shape of the eyeball, and it also allows the muscles to attach to the sclera. The site of attachment of the extraocular muscles, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, at all, they attach to the sclera. And the thinnest part, that's an important MCQ, which is the thinnest part of the sclera. The thinnest part of the sclera is just behind the attachment of the rectus muscle. Remember, wherever the superior rectus, inferior rectus, middle rectus, lateral rectus, wherever they attach, just behind the attachment is the thinnest part, okay? So that ruptures very easily. That is why we must know the thinnest part, where it ruptures very easily. And the thickest part 
is at the posterior pole where it joins the optic disc and the optic nerve. Okay, so we need to know these anatomical peculiarities. Thinnest part of the sclera behind the attachment of the rectus muscles or just at the attachment of the rectus muscles and thickest at the optic disc or optic nerve. And there are three layers of the sclera also, which you do not usually ask, but it's useful to know. There's the episclera, which is above the sclera, the stroma and the lamina fusca. The lamina fusca, stroma and the episclera are the three layers of the sclera. Sclera is white in color and appears icteric or yellowish in jaundice. Okay, so this is the sclera, you see that. And this will be the limbus, you see. The cornea is the thin transparent area, which you cannot see. It's mounted like a watch glass. Like a watch glass, the cornea is mounted on the sclera. You can't see that. The junction is the limbus and this is the white sclera. Very well. Then the next part of the anatomical discussion about the cornea is, remember, this is an important question. What is the shape of the cornea? Remember, it's not a sphere. It's not a sphere. It's like a sphere. That's why it's called a spheroid. We call it a prolate spheroid. This is the technically correct name for the shape of the cornea. Prolate spheroid means that it's like a sphere, but unlike a sphere which is equally curved in all places, this is more curved in the center. Please remember that the human cornea is more curved in the center, so it is more powerful in the center. So it can bend more rays in the center because simply because the curvature of the cornea is more or steeper in the center compared to the periphery. You have one more shape called the oblate spheroid where the curvature is more in the periphery. Okay, But this is a prolate spheroid. Very well. And it is completely transparent. 90% of light is transmitted. Imagine only 10% of light gets scattered. is an amazingly powerful structure because 90% of light gets transmitted, okay? And light transmission occurs because of the collagen. That is, the collagen, see the cornea and the stroma and the, and the sclera have the same structure. They are made of glycosaminoglycans, which is gags, glycosa, aminoglycans, gags and collagen. The difference is why the cornea is clear and why the sclera is opaque is in the arrangement of the collagen, you see? In the collagen, of the cornea, they are regular. The collagen fibrils are parallel and regular arranged like this. That is why they do not scatter too much light. They're because of regularity, they transmit most of the light. In the sclera, the arrangement of the collagen is crisscross, irregular, and not in parallel bundles. That is why it cannot transmit light. Sclera mostly it scatters light, is not so the same structure but different arrangement. Very well. In the cornea, you all know or where the six layers of the cornea, which we'll discuss one by one. There used to be five layers till about eight years back when the sixth layer was discovered. This will discuss all in good time. And in the cornea, what are the anatomical peculiarities? It is the thinnest in the center. Remember, we need to know the corneal thickness, which is measured by an instrument called a pachymeter. You can see the pachymeter here. The word pachy means thick, meter instrument. So this is how the pachymeter looks. You touch the tip of the pachymeter, the center of the cornea, and in one second or one minute at the most, it will give you the thickness of the cornea. This is approximately from 500 to 600 microns with an average pachy of 540 microns. Can you remember that? We sometimes like to ask you that. What is the average corneal thickness is approximately 540 microns, but it varies from patient to patient. And why we need the thickness? Because of multiple reasons, one of which is the intraocular pressure measurement depends upon the corneal thickness, as we discussed when we do glaucoma. Remember, when we measure the intraocular pressure, we place the tonometer over the cornea, and because the tonometer is placed over the cornea, so the thickness of the cornea influences the pressure. Thick corneas measure falsely high, thin corneas measure falsely low, but all this in good time. So, kindly remember the thinnest part of the cornea is in the center, which is what we're really interested in. We call this thing as CCT. We call this as CCT. It stands for central corneal thickness. Okay, Central corneal thickness, which is our average is about 540 microns. Very well. Then also remember that the cornea simply happens to be the most powerful refracting surface of the eye. Cornea bends the maximum light out of all the structures in the eyeball. There are many structures which bend light, Okay, but cornea bends the maximum light. It's the most powerful. It contributes 43 diopters out of the 60 diopteric eyeball. Okay, that means a whopping 70% of the power of the eyeball is contributed by the cornea. Okay, 43 out of 60 diopters. 
Also, cornea is avascular, you know, that the cornea does not have any blood vessels. So, if it's avascular, where does it get its glucose and its oxygen from? It gets it from the cornea glucose, comes from the aqueous humor. But the oxygen for the cornea comes from three different sources. That is, comes from the atmospheric air, the tear film and the aqueous humor. Okay. So, please remember, there are three sources for oxygen from the air, oxygen is also oxygen for the cornea, but only one source of glucose for the cornea. The three sources are the atmospheric air, which is the major component of the oxygen, the tear film and the aqueous humor. So, three sources of oxygen, but only one source of glucose. What of nerve supply? The nerves of the cornea, very, very sensitive. They are from the ophthalmic branch of the fifth nerve. So, the trigeminal has three branches of his ophthalmic branch gives the sensory nerve supply of the cornea, one of the most sensitive structures to touch. So this is about cornea.